Go to the forthcoming budget and when Jim Chalmers, the Treasurer, handed down his first budget in October 2022, one of his fiercest, most immediate critics was Stephen Hamilton, Assistant Professor of Economics at the George Washington University in Washington and a visiting fellow at the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at ANU. Among his memorable lines is Jim Chalmers, a man without a plan. All spin, no substance. More a Wayne Swan, his mentor, than a Paul Keating, the subject of his doctoral thesis. And you don't get a gold star for not being wildly, recklessly irresponsible. Well, since then, the government has produced one uh, and about to be two budget surpluses, the never-ending deficits that Hamilton feared did not eventuate. But ominously, government spending is rising much faster than inflation. I spoke with Steve Hamilton from Washington late this week and started by asking if he retracted any of what he said about the Treasurer and his first budget. G'day, Ross. Not one bit, to be honest. I feel like <laughs> hearing those things, I kind of think, of, well, maybe I was about right. Uh, so I think, you know, a lot of people gave the government and the Treasurer in particular the benefit of the doubt. You know, we had a new government. They, we, we didn't know a lot about them. We didn't have a lot of detail about what they do. Uh, so a lot of people gave them time i oh, wait wait one more budget wait one more budget well we're about to see budget three and to be honest uh i think the government's scenario is exactly uh what a lot of us feared back in 2022 and what did you fear back in 2022 that the government could not control spending yeah so we we knew that inflation was a big problem at the beginning of 2022, right? So uh, the, the, the last government's final budget, uh, you know, they spent a little bit too much money. I was very critical of that. Uh, and, you know, a couple of weeks later, we got that very, that first very high inflation read. And so we kind of, at that point, before the election, knew this would be a problem. And as you know, the Reserve Bank raised interest rates for the first time before then. The government had fair warning, right? We, we saw what happened overseas. We knew inflation was a problem domestically. They came in as a new government. And I actually think they had a a potential to genuinely do something to help inflation, not just to be neutral, not just to be modestly inflationary, but to genuinely take pressure off the Reserve Bank. They didn't do that. They made things worse, uh, and they've continued to make things worse all the way through to today. Uh, and that's why uh, not only have we had, you know, a stream of very rapid interest rate rises, but, you know, now looks like it might be another couple uh, uh, before the Reserve Bank is done. So just go to that point, because the government would then argue, well, hang on, we've actually driven this budget into surplus because there are so many people employed. And as uh, I know, you know, the government makes more than half of its money from PAYG taxpayers. So the more people in work, the more money the government makes. Isn't that at least yes. some credit to the government that we have a budget in surplus? The, the budget makes this crystal clear. It splits the, the changes to the budget from budget to budget into things the government controls and things the government doesn't control. If you look at all of the upside, all of it, it comes from things the government doesn't control. It comes from strong economy, you know, th this, this COVID overhang of spending, high inflation, all of these things have improved the budget. The things that the government does control have actually ma made the budget radically worse off. In, in the last budget alone, there was $12 billion of additional spending that they decided to engage in. Uh, and that is, there is no question that those items of discretion that the government chose pushed inflation up and pushed interest rates up. Uh, when you combine that with a lot of these other measures, like the, you know, um, very robust support for minimum and award wage increases, which pushed the wages of millions of people up, you know, you put all of this stuff together, the off budget spending, it, it, it adds up to a, a fiscal position that, whether you like it or not, is, is genuinely inflationary. And now, what we needed to see was the opposite, right? We needed to see the government step back to pull money out of the economy to take some of the pressure off the Reserve Bank so we didn't just have to kill this thing with, it, with, with interest rates alone. The government chose not to do that, and now we all face the consequences. And is there some, shall I say, disconnect between what businesses and households are feeling right now as a result of higher interest rates and higher inflation and having to cut back versus the government, which on a, a daily basis seems to be handing out more billions of dollars to industry or to, to state governments or yes. to whomever it might be? There seems to be something of a disconnect between what the government's doing and what the real world experience is right now. 
Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I would say two things. One, it's not just the federal government. So we have to put, you know, plenty of blame goes around, uh, including to state governments. Now, just two days ago, the Queensland government announced the largest ever energy support in the history of Australia. So they're giving Queensland is $1,000 off their energy bills. Now, they will say that's disinflationary because it's pushing energy prices down. But here's the thing. Uh, if people use as much energy as they would have used before, then you've just given them $1,000. And what are they going to do with that $1,000? They're going to go and spend, right? So, you know, we had this bizarre argument from the government that, that all of these measures are not inflationary, that they're not going to uh, push demand up, that they're not going to make interest rates higher. Uh, that's just false, right? From, from from any reasonable economist I speak to, no one believes that. And and these state government measures add a significant inflationary pressure to the federal ones, not to mention, you know, a huge demand for infrastructure spending, uh, which is putting massive pressure on the labour market, pushing up housing costs, putting, pushing up construction costs, which have been a big part of inflation. And, and, you know, that's the kind of thing that the government could easily have pulled the lever on, right? Pushed some of that spending out, uh, waited for inflation to come down uh, in, in order to kind of get things under control. And we would have saved a lot of money to boot, right? Because as inflation is rising rapidly, that's the last time you want to be building stuff. But then on top of that, there's also the tax cuts, the stage three tax cuts that are about to come. And they deliver about $25 billion a year in terms of extra money in consumers' pockets, in the public's pockets, um, you know, over the course of the next at least four years in the, in, in the out period of this budget. So that, again, is not going to prevent inflation or spending from taking place. People are going to spend that money. Something's got to give. <laughs> <laughs> and the something that gives is inflation and interest rates, right? We, we, there's no magic magic here, right? We have a certain amount of aggregate demand. Uh, it's robust. It's, it's significantly bigger than I think even most people thought when, when this process started. And there's only one way to solve that problem, which is to suck money out of the economy. You can do it one way or another way. Inflation does it. Interest rates do it. Uh, you know, some of these ways are much worse than others. Uh, and, and again, if we had a government that understood its kind of role here, understood that it actually did have the capacity to, to help solve this problem, uh, again, I, I think that that would have been a, uh, that would have seen interest rates rise less. That would have seen interest rates stay higher for less long, and that would have seen interest rates falling more quicker than what we're going to see. So, you know, again, broaden this this thing out, take some of the pressure off the Reserve Bank, rather than you know, again, tax cuts minimum wage increases, infrastructure spending, energy relief, <laughs> you name it, we're pushing money into the economy much faster than the Reserve Bank can suck it out. And so is there easy ways, easy areas that the government could, in this budget, cut spending? Because given the fact you've got extra spending for NDIS coming, extra spending for military and defence coming, you've got extra spending coming in terms of welfare coming. So just explain where are the areas the government can cut? Yeah, so I do think, look, it, there, there is a big degree to which it would have been much better had this happened two budgets ago, right? If, if this kind of spending restraint had happened in 2022 rather than 2024, we would have avoided a lot of this impulse that we observe. Uh, unfortunately, a, a significant portion of this problem at this point is kind of locked in, right? And, and, and it's going to happen no matter what the government does. At the margin, uh, I, I, I think the government needs to do two things. One, they need to show extreme restraint, right? To the extent that they're on the fence about whether they're going to uh, do an energy rebate or... Uh, you know, increase the dole an extra $50 a week or, you know, thinking about all of these spending priorities that, that the ERC considers, that need, the, the baseline of that spending envelope needs to decrease, right? They, they need to just show a lot more restraint to the extent they can. And secondly, to the extent they have power to shift spending in time, delay spending, right? Push things out if they want to do some ambitious program, have it start in two years, three years, not this year, uh, and that includes things like infrastructure spending. To the extent they, that they want to do things, they just need to push them out, right? Uh, wait for this inflationary impulse to, to subside, and then we can get back to kind of running a government in the normal way we, we expect, where we don't face such high costs of, of, of making the decisions that we want to make. 
Well, Steve Hamilton, we're going to find out in only about 10 days' time as to what the government is going to do with all of this. As soon as it's out, I'll tell you what, we'll come back and have another chat to you at that time. Many thanks for your time today.